And so a crazy thing about young love, right? It kind of makes you blind, right? But the, uh, the reverse of that is a little touch of reality makes you 2020, right? And that's the kind of way it works. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our, our final speaker for the evening, Master Sergeant Wake. Forgive me, I'm old, so I got some uh, note cards, my memory's going. Um, I won't use the mic, if you can't hear me, probably need to turn your hearing aid up. I've never been uh, accused of being soft-spoken, so uh, we'll get going. Um, Christopher Wakeham, uh, NCE, uh, in the EOD flight, I've been in 18 years, and my story begins about 15 years ago. It's around the 2000, 2001 time frame. I was stationed at Charleston. That was my first duty station right out of EOD school. Around 2000, I started dating a good girl. Uh, and she was seven years older than me. Probably red flag number one right there. I was just happy to have a girlfriend. I'll be honest with you. I didn't care who she was at the time. I was just happy to be dating someone. She was seven years older than me. She had a four-year-old little boy. Uh, not necessarily red flag, but uh, it, it does play into the story is that she did have a four-year-old boy. So it is no surprise to anyone, I don't think, that EOD deploys a lot. That's just what we do. It's part of our job. I deployed in 99. 2000, 2002, 2003, 6, 7, 9, 11, 13, and I'll deploy later on this year. If you keep in track, that's about 11 times. The time frame I'm talking about is 2000, 2002, 2001, 2002 time frame. Around, it's about a year after I had. Uh, got to Charleston, things started to take a turn at work. By that I mean anything I did wasn't good enough. I wasn't progressing fast enough in my training, my upgrade. I started to think, and it just so happened to coincide with a, a, a new person that came to the shop started to think maybe something was working behind the scenes against me because I was doing everything I possibly could to, to, for work, for, for school, for, for everything. I did come to find out that uh, he was whispering in people's ears and doing things uh, and, and turning everyone in the shop against me. So it started to weigh on me. And this is when the boulder started. Anybody ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Beginning scene where he's running out of the cave and there's a boulder running behind him. And that, that was me. It started out as a rock. And it started to progress. And the more I ran away, the bigger it got. 2001, I was in ALS. Just what happens over the day last during September 11, 2001. We all know what happened that day. I think I had the best ALS class because they cut out all non-testable stuff. We went straight for three weeks through the weekend, and then we graduated. We didn't have all the other stuff. So, but I was in Charleston, which is C-17. So. The reason they did that is because everybody was starting to deploy or they were threatening to deploy and, and we were gonna go get the bad guys, you know? So they rushed us through and lo and behold, I got Levit the Levito Award out of ALS. I got back to my shop and not one person congratulated me or said good job. For a young, impressionable senior airman, that was devastating to me. So this stuff starts weighing on you, right? At this point, I'm in a hole, but I can see the top. I can just see over. It's about right here, but it's a hole. A 
rewind a bit. When I deployed in 2000, I made the decision to let my girlfriend take care of all my bills while I deployed. I tell you right now, that was a bad decision. <laughs> I returned from that deployment, and don't get me wrong, I didn't say here's the checkbook and you know get the bills out of the mail and, and make sure you take care of it. I had written out every single check, I had matched that with every bill, all, you had, all she had to do was put it in the mail. I returned from the deployment in 2000, she had not paid the rent for two months. She had not paid the car payment at all. She had not paid the insurance on the car at all. <clears throat> Luckily, I had made sure that my car payment was paid. It was, it was paid some other way. She wasn't in control of that. But what happens when your insurance lapses and you got a loan on your car? They call the loan. So I was facing eviction from my apartment, car repossession, and oh, before all of this, I'd been paying on three different cell phone bills. You know how many cell phones I had? Zero. Reason being is every time we would get a cell phone, she would run up the cell phone bill so high that we couldn't pay it all, so it would get shut off. What did I do? I made the great decision of going to get a different cell phone from a different company. So I think at one time I had a bill for Singular, which is now AT&T, Nextel, and maybe Verizon. And these were all $800, $900, $1,200 cell phone bills. I'm a young senior airman, early staff, and I'm trying to juggle all these bills and pay them at, at the same time. I made another really good decision. I went to the payday loan place in order to pay the bills for one month. And if you've ever done that, that's a terrible decision. I don't ever recommend it because you continue, you get into a cycle of every single month having to go back to them because you got to pay them off, but you need that money. So you got to pay them off, but you need that money. It's a vicious cycle. Don't ever do it. Probably at this point, I'm at $12,000 in debt as a brand new staff. That's not including the car repossession that I still have to pay for. Everything is falling apart at work. <coughs> All I have is, 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 I thought it was me and my girlfriend. We were gonna make this work. We were gonna do it. We were gonna work it out. Right about this time I found out she was an alcoholic. She had been hiding drinking from me, and I had no idea. She wasn't violent. She wasn't belligerent. But she was an alcoholic. She couldn't hold a job, so I wasn't getting any money from her. I was paying for everything. And I was in too deep. For all intents and purpose, I was married to this girl. I was married to her financially because you remember her four-year-old son? I couldn't kick him out because they would have nowhere to go. I was married to her emotionally and I was married to her mentally. I was so low and had such low self-esteem that I didn't think I could do any better. I didn't, I didn't even want to try to do any better. Why am I going to go somewhere else? Why am I going to do anything else? I just got to do this. I've got to make it work. Then we have what I like to call the night the cops came. She had, uh, she had gone out. She had had a job at this point. And made the other great decision of renting her a car because we, she didn't have a car anymore, remember? The car we possessed, right? So we rented her a car, paying for that. 
She went out one night after work, said she was going to go out with some friends. Um, I called her about 11 o'clock, said, when are you coming home? I said, one more drink, we're coming home. Okay, no problem. I had to go to bed. I had to get up and go to work the next day. So I went to bed, and 5 o'clock in the morning, I get a knock on the door, apartment door. I go to the door, two cops standing there. I said, sir, we need to speak with your girlfriend. She's not here. She never came home. I don't know where she's at. Gave me the card, said, sir, if you see her, it's time to call. What they also told me was the car that was rented in her name had been used in a robbery that night. You want to talk about freaking out. I haven't heard from her. I got no idea where she's at. The car she was supposed to be driving is used in a robbery. So I started calling everybody I knew. Luckily, my supervisor let me stay home and, and wait for her to get home. I called all her friends. Some of them came over. They hadn't heard from her. They didn't know where she was at. About 1 o'clock that next day, uh, she pulls up in a taxi. She comes in. Of course, I'm freaking out. What, what, what happened? Where have you been? What's going on? She says that she was on her way home. She stopped at a gas station. She was hit over the head, knocked out, and she woke up in an hour. When she woke up, she begged for enough money to get a taxi home. I said, we got to take you to the hospital. If you were knocked out for the, this amount of time, you got to go to the hospital. She refused. Red flag, right? She would not go to the hospital. <coughs> we called the cops. They came. She gave her story, but she, she wouldn't talk around me. She gave her story outside. Red flag, too, right? <coughs> she uh, eventually came clean when I pressed her and I was about to throw her in my car and take her to the hospital. She had gotten drunk, met some friends at the bar, and they had a boat. She went with them back to the boat in the marina down in Charleston. Passed out on the boat. They stole her keys and her purse. Used the car for the robbery, sell some scuba equipment or something. She woke up by herself on the boat and then found enough money to get a taxi home. So where are we at? Over $12,000 in debt, threatening getting evicted from my apartment. Already had the car repossessed. And now she pulls this stuff. The boulder is huge. And I'm doing everything I possibly can to run away from it. I don't want to face up. The, the boulder is the financial trouble, the trouble at work. I can't face it. So I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. One Friday afternoon, We shut the shop down early, had a barbecue, had some beers. Everybody left, went home. I stayed, had a few more beers. It was this night that I couldn't run any farther than the boulder hit me. Ran smack over me. I could not see the hole at the top of the hole I was in, the opening at the top of the hole I was in. I couldn't see it anymore. Everything completely crashed around me, and I contemplated killing myself to make it all stop. I am alive and standing before you now because I made 
one decision. I called my best friend. I talked to him, told him where I was at, told him how I was feeling. And he decided to make another phone call and call up my supervisor. My supervisor immediately rushed to the shop, stayed with me. My supervisor called the first sergeant. First sergeant stayed with me. This was a Friday afternoon. I spent the next seven days in the psychiatric ward of the hospital in Charleston. That's the best decision I ever made. Asking for help. Am I upset that I stayed seven days in a psychiatric ward? Hell no. Reason being is because when I was in the hospital, that boulder couldn't hit me. That boulder couldn't hurt me. I was safe. I, I spent those seven days breathing because I could breathe again. Did everything get fixed while I was in the hospital? No. I say I spent seven days in the psychiatric ward, but I think it's kind of funny that I spent two days in the actual psychiatric ward. I spent the next five days in the drunk tank. Because apparently two people in the psychiatric ward is not enough to keep that ward open, so they moved you over to the alcoholic side. Um, <laughs> there were some funny people coming in at all hours of the night. I can tell you that. But I did what I had to do. I got out. And I went to daily appointments of mental health for the next two weeks. I went to weekly appointments for the next three months. I went to monthly appointments for the next year. And that gave me what I needed to survive past that point. It's a cliche, I know, and I hate to use it, but it's tools, right? They give you the tools that you need to go beyond. Sorry, Butterfield knows what I'm talking about. Those little tools, those little things that help you move past and help you break up that boulder that's behind you that you're running away from piece by piece. Now, the meetings of mental health, that wasn't the only thing to help you. I mean, let's be honest. Shortly after this, I decided I got to get out of Charleston. I'd been here six years. And I went to Korea. That was the easiest way to get out of Charleston is volunteer for Korea. Anybody know the easiest way to get out of anywhere is volunteer for Korea, right? So I, uh, I went to Korea, went to Kunsan, and uh, I met the other part of my recovery. She's sitting right there. The little purple haired purple lady over there. Uh, I met her, and uh, we've been together ever since. Went to Korea, got my finances in order. I'm here to tell you, as much debt as I had, a year and a half after I left Charleston, I was 100% completely debt free. And if you're in debt and you're looking for a good program, I recommend Dave Ramsey. Read his books, Financial Peace, Total Money Makeover. He's brilliant. If you never read Dave Ramsey, please do. Was it easy? Hell no. Do I still struggle with it every single day? Yes. Do I know how to deal with it now? Yes. One of the things that I want people to take away from my story, probably the main thing, the reason I want to tell my story, is because I'm a huge advocate of breaking down the stigma of going to mental health and seeking help. Reason being, the only negative effect, if you can even call it negative, that I've ever had, 
from seven days in a psychiatric facility, countless appointments at mental health. As my EPR leaving Charleston, I was marked down to one place on the front for financial responsibility. Makes sense to me. I agree with it. But that's it. It's the only thing. When I got here in 2010, I got here in 2009. In 2010, I was step promoted to master sergeant. That's not easy. So if you think there's lasting negative effects to seeking help, you are wrong. I'm a living, breathing example of how it only helps. It doesn't hurt. If you feel the weight of the world, if you are running away from a boulder, turn around, face it, and ask for the help that you need. I'm alive, standing here before you, because I did that very thing and made a phone call. That's my story. So before we go on anymore, I just want to to give a, another another uh, just some congratulations and a, a thank you for the folks that, that, that shared their story today. It's not easy to do. Um, I mean, number one, public speaking is probably the scariest thing that most people will say, if you, if you did a little chart, what's the scariest thing you could possibly do? And usually public speaking is way up. And then to tell such a personal story, um, that probably goes up right underneath it. That's like a 1A. So thank you guys so much for sharing your stories. The second thing that I wanted to say is, um, just like Sergeant Wakeham said, if you have issues going on, do not be ashamed to ask for help. You know, it's a funny thing, as, uh, as an analogy I used when I was doing sure duty. Everybody walks around and they have like a backpack of stress, right? It's manageable, it's on there, and you know how to deal with it, right? Hands are free, you can walk around, you're good. Something comes up, well, maybe you grab a bag, all right? You still got a hand free, you're still walking around, you're still mobile. But as life starts to hit you, your hands start getting full. And it's that moment where you can either break or ask for help, and that help is say, please take this, at least get a hand free. Talk to a friend, talk to a family member, or talk to the agencies that we've, we've talked about already today. And at least let them take the load off you for a moment and take it a step back and get some perspective on what's going on, right? Guys, there is folks that work with you, that are, that are in your homes, right, that are struggling in silence. Do you know their stories? And just like the chief said, um, Chief Roy said, find a way to open up those, those lines of communication and that dialogue with the folks you work with, your friends, and your family members. It's hard, it really is. You know, but one of the things that I've seen, I've been in 21 years, and one of the things I've seen, I've seen good airmen turn bad, and no one takes the time to figure out why. Man, he was good at his last base. I don't know why he came here and he fell off the map. Is it because he just doesn't like Seymour Johnson? Yeah, I've heard that. I've only been here for a year, I think it's great, right? Or is it something a little deeper? And that's one of those things that that instead of looking at that guy or looking at that girl in their shop and, and just automatically dismissing them as, oh, they got problems, their attitude, why do they have problems? Have you taken the time to talk to them and see what's going on underneath? And with that, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight, and I want to thank um, you guys for listening. This has just been a great experience for me, 
and, uh, and I hope we do a lot more of these. And with that, the plan is to do as many more, as many more, as, as many of these as we possibly can, but we need your help. So with this one, it was kind of a focus on resiliency, right? Because it's a down day, it's resiliency day, so there was, there was a lot of stories in that vein. But for the future storytellers event, we kind of want to mix it up. Funny stories, inspirational stories. And so at the back of the room, there is a sign-up sheet. And if any of you in the room know of somebody or you, you yourself would like to tell a story, please sign up. Because we would, the goal is to kind of do these quarterly. And I think, I think it would be great for the wing to do that. Um, on your table, there's some feedback forms. If there's something that you would, you would like to add, say, hey, you know, the event was cool, but maybe add this, um, please do that. Or it was horrible and, and they should never, ever do it again. Please don't do that. No, I'm just kidding. If you feel that way, go ahead. Um, I also want to thank kind of the brains behind the whole operation tonight, and that's Sergeant Oville and my wife, Sergeant McDougall, who was back there with my crazy kids in the back room. Um, it was their vision, and everything you see here is because of them, so thank you. <laughs> and Sergeant Pinion. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, and also I want to thank the support agencies that helped out as well. Um, from the chaplain, to the first sergeants, to the bridge church, all of the things that you see here, the food and the, the beverages, um, and also the club, we couldn't have done it without their help. So, so thank them. And with that, what's that? The passport, yes. So I was told that this was a passport event. So if you guys know what the passport event is, everybody's like, yes. It was me. So Got make sure proof. you get your stamp. And it's back there in the back, okay? And with that, um, thank you again, thank you for coming to the video.